Welcome to the You Go First podcast. This is the place where we bring together thought leaders, business pioneers, personal development gurus, and just about any person we discover that will inspire and compel you to go first in all areas of your life. Please welcome keynote speaker, philanthropist, and the official head dream chaser for Odyssey Teams, Inc., our host, Lane Hensley. Welcome to another episode of You Go First. I'm your host, Lane Hensley, and I'm very excited to have in studio Mr. David Niffin. Welcome, Niff. Thanks for being here this morning. Thanks for having me. All right, so who's this Niff guy? Let me tell you a little about our guest this morning. Uh, I met David when he was a, just a sophomore in high school. He grew up here in Chico, California, and he was just one of those standout high school kids that in our work in leadership and in public schools and trying to inspire uh, greater leaders in the next generation, he rose to the top of his group and uh, found himself working at Odyssey. And we sort of stayed in touch over the years. He went on to uh, play college volleyball and ended up playing volleyball in Europe as a pro. You were, I believe, setter of the year in the uh, college spectrum and uh, just a big part of the UC Irvine Anteaters program down there. And went on to then, you know, UC Irvine is four time national champions. Uh, in uh, September, let's see, I believe in 2012, you took over the program as the head coach mm -hmm. and uh, went on to win a national championship in that first year as head coach. So why would we have a volleyball coach on You Go First when we're talking about leadership and life and business and all that stuff? And for me, it's just a no brainer because um, I love volleyball. I coach volleyball and volleyball to me is just a reflection of life and it, the chaos of it, trying to produce some order in that. And when you're going for the big kill, uh, you have people supporting you, people covering what you're trying to create. And so in Odyssey and in our work out there uh, in leadership and in teams, it's all about pushing people to work better in teams. And that's certainly what happens on the court uh, on and off the court because it's a long season. I think it's a, a nine month season. Plus, you're with these guys at the NCAA D1 level. It's a pretty much a year around occupation. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, you know, let's just start with where you started as far as just a, a young kid in Chico, California, dreaming of playing professional volleyball and dreaming of maybe coaching a team at the very top level in the world. Uh, what what seeds did you have in your mind back then? What were inspirations you had back then that you still pull from today as you, and I, I want to not use the word coach, but really lead these young men, these you know 16 to 20 young men through college and through trying to perform at the highest level of their sport? Yeah, I, my dreams didn't go that far when I was in high school. You know, I was, I was dreaming kind of next step. And uh, I think the first thing I discovered volleyball, uh, I believe in eighth grade, it was a, it was a book report that we were actually, it was a, a report about ourselves and we had to go expert, uh, interview an expert in the field. So I interviewed Jim Brenton, who was the, the head coach at Chico state at the time. And he said, you know, if you're interested in this kind of thing, well, why don't you come to my camp? So I signed up for this girls volleyball camp and, and started playing. I was the only guy there in, you know, genius. Yeah. At the time, I don't think I realized that. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, I got there, but I, I fell in love with playing and uh, I really just wanted to keep playing. And so in order to play, um, there were some hurdles and to get over those hurdles required, um, you know, some of those same kind of strategies or tactics you do use with any challenge. Uh, one was that we didn't have a high school team at the time. So I think one of the first times I really found myself in a position of leadership on this kind of quest of playing more was, uh, and with huge support from my parents, uh, we petitioned the school board and actually started boys volleyball at Chico high after my sophomore year in high school. And they let us start a self-funded program. Uh, so that was, that was kind of the first time that I found volleyball and leadership kind of converging in the same spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I happen to know the person who I believe was the head coach in those early years, Rob can a uh, good friend of ours still to this day. And what a great guy, his daughter actually just got pulled up to varsity. So you know, there's always like this, it's so weird how life works. And I think as listeners out there, I think there's just a reality that look around your life right now, everybody. And there's probably relationships that are going to be significant in the years ahead. And you might not realize the value of those relationships. When we first connected, when Rob, I worked with Rob mm -hmm. at Sports LTD when I was a college student and all these points of light continue to connect for me. And as you search the, the planet, really, for these volleyball players and then connect them as a group, you know, you spend a couple of weeks at the beginning of the season helping them really understand the culture that you're trying to create as a leader. And I think culture is so important to leaders out there and to people when they really buy into a culture. 
So tell us a little bit about how you, now that you're, you've gone through those pathways, you've found you, you started a program in high school, end up playing at the top level, end up playing pro, and then find yourself as a head coach of a national championship team. And, and UCI has won four national championships. So you're part of really excellence and really a championship program. Uh, what are your philosophies around how to create a culture that will sustain the kind of you know performance that you expect from your team? Yeah, that's that's what we're we're curious about every year. Um, I think one of the things we do that that's been so special and, and with huge influence from you and, and and others in the community, we we've been able to kind of isolate ourselves away a little bit. We've been able to get some quiet time and space with this team and really kind of just feel out what's what is important. What are some of those qualities uh, on the team that that we already know? I mean, most of the time. We, we know what a good teammate looks like. If we really search our heart of hearts, we know what a good teammate looks like. If we're talking about a garden, we, we know what a weed looks like. You know, we, yeah. we know what the good, the good qualities are. We kind of, we know what the bad qualities are. Uh, and we really want to overshadow those bad qualities or those, those character traits in a teammate that maybe we wouldn't want at the forefront. Uh, so one of the ways we do that, uh, and it's in all of us, you know, the, the things that our guys are identifying this week, I think something that's been uh, kind of an epiphany moment for me is we're talking about some of these values of, you know, trust and trust leading to vulnerability and the importance of that. We're talking about gratitude. We're talking about attention to detail. And we're just talking about the love that you can have with the teammate and how different your relationship with someone in the workplace is, whether that's a, a job, you know, you're spending eight hours a day with them or as a teammate on the court with them and kind of seeing them at their best, but also seeing them at their worst. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a really special relationship. And to hear our guys talk about those qualities, the moment for me that, that was really the epiphany moment was these things exist in all our relationships already. And really we're talking about to what level, what is the quality of those things? You and I have trust that we've built over years. Um, you and I both have gratitude for each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we have that for our, our spouses. We have that for other people in our lives. What we're curious about is, is how deep do we want to go with that stuff? So what we do here is we, we set them apart for two weeks from their technology. Uh, we put them in an environment that's different where maybe, maybe they can't hang on to the things that they felt comfortable with before. And then what we find is that they start hanging on to each other. And you know, as long as we're giving them some structure to grow on uh, that grows them in the direction we desire, you know, we insert a little bit of Lane Hensley and Odyssey and we, we help them understand the vision and what it could look like to chase this and give them some tools and some strategies and some activities to help them kind of understand themselves. This, I think for me, is the, the fundamental part of kind of building what are you capable of. The going back part, I find myself saying often to them, uh, okay, now you've shown me what you're capable of this becomes the new expectation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's whether that's a skill or something they did great. And we're really trying to highlight those things. So it's less about, okay, here's some areas you need to work. And you know, gosh, we're not very good at this yet. It's a lot more about, wow, look at that threshold we just got to. Okay, that becomes your new minimum there. And then through that, we, we find and we hope that the, the other minimums or the areas we want to get better kind of just trail along with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not unlike a salesperson, you know, they achieve a certain number and then the manager's like, congratulations, you hit your stretch goal. That's now your standard. Yep. And now you have to exceed that. And I think, you know, you guys obviously know some of the, uh, the, the opponents that you're going to face, you know, their defensive strategies. And I think companies are the same way. They understand their competition. And how do you put yourself, like you said, in isolation and really work to develop your very best aside from just getting good enough to beat your opponent, but becoming, and I think you coined this phrase, you know, cultivating champions to win championships. Mm -hmm. And I love the word cultivating because we talk a lot about farming and, you know, when you plant a seed and uh, this, this goal of cultivating something that, you know, will come in the distant future. Uh, where did that, that cultivating champions to win championships? Because I think in, in leadership, whether you're leading your company or your family or school, you know, really that vision of, okay, what am I cultivating? How do I cultivate champions in my home? How do I cul cultivate champions in my family? Where did that come from? Yeah, I mean, that came from you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, you know, it's, I, yeah, I think back and I look at my journey, you know, through this and, um, you know, one of the, I guess the way it was really said most recently was one of the first times we worked with our team back in the fall of 2014 before we went on to, you know, that was the year in 2015, we won the uh, regular season and the conference tournament, which is very difficult to do in our mm -hmm. league because the national champion had really, to that point, had come from our league, I think all but just a couple years in the history of, of the league. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was tough. We ended up going to the national semifinals that year, losing in the semifinals, but certainly a relevant team for the national championship quest. 
And, you know, one of the things you said to us was, look, there's, there's the law of the farm and there's the law of the school, you know, and in school, I think we get in this habit of, we, we can cram for this. Um, mm-hmm. The law of the farm is, you know, the, the, the farmer can't cram for the harvest. You know, you gotta, you gotta plant the seed. You gotta protect it from, you know, whatever predators are out there. You gotta take care of the weeds, make sure there's on there. You gotta give it nutrients and nourishment. The mm-hmm. weather has to play a factor. There's some chance involved. You know, there's all these variables in play. It's a much longer process but the harvest is worth it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that would be true in our relationships as well with these guys. Something that, that Johnny said, uh, one of the guys on our team this year, we're doing book reports with the guys and you know, they had a summer read and then they present to the team. And, and what I tell them is I go, you know, this isn't really a report on the book because really the guys aren't that interested in the book itself. This is a report on our team. So when you do this book report, that's how I want you to frame it. You're going to read this book as an opportunity to gain illustrations for our team to talk about our team. And Johnny read a book uh, called The Advantage. And, uh, you know, one of the comments in there is that, you know, companies can no longer rely. Teams for us can no longer rely on information or knowledge trading hands because it just happens too quickly. So keeping something secret, a training method or, or how a team practices, there's scouting reports out there now. Yeah, right. I would imagine in business, it would be the same way. If your company's developing something, somebody else is going to figure out how to develop it and maybe do it better than you. So what then is the competitive differentiator? And it has to be culture. Mm-hmm. It has to be a healthy team culture. Uh, so that's what we're really focused on here. Yeah. You know, for those listeners out there that don't really savvy to volleyball. So in volleyball, you you get the most three contacts and there's mm-hmm. kind of primary defenders and then there's the setter. Uh, and then there's the attackers. Ideally, they're attacking when we have a chance to score and they're defending by blocking and making different moves uh, when it's time to defend the attacking team. And to me, there's so many metaphors in you know, what it takes as far as you know, the libero, who's really this primary defender, who if they're doing their job really well, they're almost unnoticed on the court. And that's you know, your accounts receivable, that's your, you know, your, your general manager, that's your person that's just making everything work smoothly. And the setter is just setting up those salespeople or setting up those leaders to succeed. And uh, like I said, the covering, but you know, you've got six players on the court, they have these, all these finite rules about how many subs, and, but you've got you know, 17 or 18 people on the roster that are traveling or that are over on the bench. And, and I think that's a common challenge for, you know, every company out there that, you know, how do you keep everybody engaged knowing that they have to have a role? All those roles are so important. And some roles are on the court, you know, getting the highlight reels, getting the accolades, getting the player mm-hmm. of the year and all that stuff. And, you know, tell us a bit about just what, like you said, culture is a part of it. And of course, here, as you start this campaign, this season, you know, it's always a looming question of how will the guys and the team come together to create a culture that really values every person. Any, any insights in how you do that? I mean, I think everybody who leads a team is wondering, how do I keep everybody involved? Uh, and, you know, in volleyball, there's, you, you eventually write down their number and they step on the court and the others can sure. be like demoralized or they can be motivated that they're a part of a program that's championship level. Right. I think one of the things that was really dramatic for me in terms of a shift and, and kind of helped me understand how I want to lead this program is, and, and I think some of it changed with, with kids and family and, you know, we look at the hours in the day and what are we doing with those? And, uh, I think something for me is, you know, in our volleyball season, and, and I love that, that volleyball gets to be the example here because it is, it's such a crowded team sport. You mm-hmm. know, for those that don't know it, it's a 900 square foot. It's side. the most players in the smallest space of any sport. And right. it's so random and it's so fast. Yes. And, and, uh, uh, and, and it does require, you know, you, you cannot just take the ball and run for a touchdown. You cannot, you know, just say, okay, everybody clear to this side. I'm going to go dunk it. Uh, it. It requires multiple contacts by multiple people. And, and the, the systems and where you're allowed to stand and where you're not, you know, everybody has to kind of move around. And so there, there is this very cool opportunity of it. It's the consummate team sport. Um, and I, I do love that about it. But in terms of, you know, your question, I think for us, we look at the season and we go, gosh, there's one day the national championship is going to be held out of a, a 365 day year. And there's, you know, there's 30 days where matches will be played. If we do everything right and go through the playoffs, it's about 30 matches in a season for us. Uh, you know, and then if you, if you back it up even more, there's 280 days in an academic year and we're only going to train for, you know, a hundred of those days because we have our own limitations and rules, but, but we're going to live together kind of in this quest Mm -hmm. for an entire calendar year. This never stops. And so the, the majority of our life, you know, where we're living life, where we're finding value 
cannot be from those singular small moments. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we're looking at where are we living in all those moments throughout the year. Mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, the, the difference for us is, you know, how are you feeling about your teammates? Are you putting in time and space with them? Like we have concentrated time and space here. Uh, but are you taking the time to go, you know, barbecue with your teammate? Are you making an effort on a daily basis in little moments to say thank you to our strength coach? Uh, you know, are you looking guys in the eye and, and tell them, hey, I'm, I'm grateful you're here mm-hmm. uh, because we have all this opportunity to play, compete. And what we've found is that our, our greatest combatant to feeling entitled, our greatest combatant to feeling uh, frustrated with our position on the team or that we're not playing is just to look around and open our eyes and just lead with gratitude. Mm-hmm. And, and that's been really special. Uh, but I think that's how we that's how we start to orient towards kind of living in that space. So when those championship moments come, we can be fully present for our teammates Mm -hmm. and we can, you know, without hanging on anything for ourselves, be really grateful and glad that that person to the right or the left is having success because we've practiced being grateful that that person is in our life for all those moments that weren't the starting lineup moment or weren't the national Mm -hmm. championship moment. Yeah. You know, uh, you really touched on it when you were talking about the the time you guys were in the semifinals, you know, following a national championship and then just uh, finding yourself in and, and not not getting to the final match, not winning again. And I think, you know, there's times we measure results, you know, how, how did this moment go? And there's times when it has to be about process. It has to be about relationships. Mm-hmm. And if if all of the teams, how many teams are competing for the national championship? How many teams are in that conversation? Yeah, I'm, Total from, from the very bottom team to the top. Yeah, maybe 30. So you have 30 teams, each of them carrying 15 to 20 people on their roster. So, you know, you've got 500 people out there, uh, coaches and all striving for something that this small percentage are going to truly achieve. Mm-hmm. It can't be that only those 20 plus coaches get to actually celebrate the year. It has to be about something bigger than that. And that I think as leaders is a really challenging thing, but like you touched on, like it's not just that three hour match that defines who we are. It's about the relationships. It's about the culture. It's about the company. It's about the people, our families. And, you know, as we look at, as as I look at my own career and getting to kind of walk this volleyball career with you, uh, you know, what any, any, I mean, you're a young guy, you got lots of years of coaching, but what's kind of legacy stuff when you think of guys that played for you four or five or eight years ago, what do you want them to say about NIF as a coach? What are you trying to, you know, really represent? Like, I always say, you know, like people might never read your book, but they read it by interacting with you, that you are your book. Mm-hmm. What would your book say? What do you want them to remember about your coaching? Uh, just hopefully that it was, it was intentional. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing for me when I, when I look at these guys is I'm, I'm doing my best, uh, you know, and, and it's a, we, we said yesterday actually in practice, you know, I mean, one of the most beautiful things here is that we're imperfect people playing an imperfect game that's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> that's, that's a rough cocktail. Um, but you know what? Everybody else is doing that too. And I think that's, that's really liberating. You know, you, we look around and it's like, gosh, okay. So the team we're going to play against also is faced daily with, you know, when, when we talk about competition, there are going to be results out there. We're going to want to focus on every team is playing an imperfect game with imperfect people. And there are going to be moments every single day that move towards fracturing a team or move towards bringing a team together. Mm-hmm. And we want to be as intentional as possible about finding those moments, identifying them, being aware of them, cultivating that awareness, and then choosing to move in a direction that's, that's healing instead of hurting. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the classic, you know, you're either adding to or you're taking away. Yeah. There's really not, if it exists, it's very minimal neutral space at all. And so my hope is that as we go through and guys look back, they go, well, you know, better coaches out there, but if if did his best for us and he was certainly intentional with what he was trying to do and where he was trying to take us was good Mm -hmm. i think one of your players you have your players have a favorite quote one of your players i think reed had uh, all in or in the way (laughs) and that mantra of like are we all in for each other are we all in for our goal and not just the goal of a national championship but the goal of the culture we want to create that cultivating champions and really getting people all in around the culture of your company or your community or your school or whatever is a very challenging thing and really clarifying what is that goal and why is it important to you? And I know I think you're a bit unique and, you know, in coaching, but leading your team in that quest to be a champion in your, who you are as a person. 
and I know that if you look back at the last eight years and maybe beyond of people coming out of the UCI program, they're leading companies, they're, they're successful in their personal lives. And I think that's obviously, uh, for me, at least the highest level of success is not just four national championships, but that you're, you're pushing out really, really quality people that understand what it takes to operate at a really high level, whether that's you know, leading, like I said, any place in your life. Uh, what's, what do you think are biggest challenges that you see on the forefront? And maybe some of your players will listen to this at some point. So, uh, you know, it's always just, you know, as you look at the landscape of the future for this next season, what are the biggest challenges you think you'll be facing as you're leading them through, like you say, that imperfect and really chaotic, uh, work environment, if you will. Yeah. I remember a great scene and remember the Titans, you know, it's, it's just a, the classic team movie, you know, and they, they go up to this training camp and they, they have this transformative experience where this team really starts to come together. Uh, and then they get back and the insulation of training camp is gone. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they're hit with the, the realities of, of real life. And, uh, and it's tough, you know, you're talking about cultivating. I think the challenges for us is, we work so hard as managers, leaders, coaches, um, even even people within our organizations. You know, our guys are working hard on planting good seeds and letting these seeds take root. And if you run with that analogy, then I would say we're about to transplant, you know, hmm. these, these little these little saplings out into an environment that maybe they're not ready for yet. And so the the fear is that you know you, we, we look out your window and we're beautiful Chico and you know awesome office and we look around and there's these established huge trees that can withstand so much mm -hmm. and then we look at these these guys that are not you know they're still developing they're 18 to 22 years old yeah uh, but that could be true for you and I too as we're as we're cultivating new skills in ourselves or or, or new awareness and then we go out and we're faced with this storm that we're going to be in and it could, it could blow us right off course. It could knock yeah. us over and those roots are gone, you know? Um, so I know that's abstract, but that, that is the challenge for us without yeah. identifying one specific thing to volleyball. I would say the most useful thing for anyone listening to this is there's something you're working on right now that you're trying to become better at. There's something that you're excited about, or you've identified as I've got a possibility to grow in this area. And that should be super exciting. And the terrifying thing for a manager or a leader or someone around you, or even with our own kids as we watch them learn, is that if you put that skill out there in the storm too early and you get discouraged because you get knocked over, you may abandon it. And we don't want you to do that. Mm -hmm. We want you to be able to get back up, throw those roots back down again and keep trying. Yeah. And then at some point, if it's, if it's valuable to you, it will take root and you'll be able to withstand. Uh, but yeah. that's, that's our, our fear and our challenge. Yeah. Well, I think beautiful teammates pick each other up in those moments, you know, great coaches and great teammates and great leaders, That's right. you know, see in people what they don't see in themselves at That's the right. time. I think about my life and people who saw things in me that I didn't see at the time and really uh, believing beyond the current evidence. Uh, I think there's a quote that says, uh, to do the impossible, you have to see the invisible. That's right. And, you know, if the premier skill is seeing the future as a leader, as a volleyball player, as a coach, you know, how far in the future can you see based on the landscape and the data that's available? And, you know, I hope people are inspired this morning and today to, to listen to you and hear, you know, as a coach and as a leader, you know, you are in this really unique, chaotic environment. Like you say, you can't just slow down the ball like in basketball, just dribble up a little slower and we'll set up a play. It happens, the, the contact points on the ball have to be fast. You can't mm -hmm. lift the ball. You can't carry the ball. So it's all happening in real time, really fast. I think it's a beautiful connection to just life right now with our cell phones and our email. And it's 24 seven. There's just no stopping point. Mm -hmm. um, except for when you go back to serve, you know, it's a closed skill. It's like your world. And hmm, can I go to my Zen back here? And people have those rare moments where they're totally in control of how they're responding to the crowd or to the pressure of the environments that they're in. And, you know, I think it becomes more and more important that people catch those moments mm -hmm. and really, we call it a closed skill in volleyball mm -hmm. and where they have a closed skill moment where, hey, I'm in control right now about how I respond to this and what I, what I begin as they start a point. And that's, and even that is eight seconds. You know, even then there is a time yeah. limit on how long you can stand back there, you know, <laughs> right. but, I, but I think this is, this yeah. is incredibly, this is an incredibly valuable point, right? Because. Uh, sometimes I think we look at these things and as a coach, I'm like, wow, I could use a week to just think about this. I don't have a week. 
Uh, but I have eight seconds to think about my next action. I have three seconds before I open my mouth and say something. You know, I have time to take a deep breath before I just viscerally respond or reflexively respond to something. And as a coach or a manager or a leader, it's something that I see our best leaders on the team doing is before they jump in and try to fix or correct, they pause. Mm -hmm. And there's just that, that moment of pause, especially as we're learning skills can be so valuable. Yeah. There's such a beautiful flow to, of course, I love volleyball. I think it's this beautiful dance when it's happening uh, really beautifully when they're all together. But, uh, but you get immediate feedback and I think people shy away from feedback. And I think, it, you know, great athletes and, and certainly in the volleyball game, they, 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 uh, they get comfortable getting feedback. As soon as you contact the ball, it tells you, hey, was my angle correct? Because there it goes, you know, it's pretty undeniable. It went in the bleachers or it went to perfectly where you want it. And, and you can't deny that. It's like, yep, that's where it went. I hit mm -hmm. it there because it bounced off of me. And I think in, in an office, in a, in a community, you know, people are bouncing off each other. And sometimes we deny the reality of how we influenced that ball, mm -hmm. how we influenced that relationship. And there's a real level of accountability to the measurable of where did it go? Uh, and I think, you know, you could ask people, where did your relationship go? And how, what, what did, how did you influence that trajectory after it contacted you? Uh, and how did the people around you respond to it? And, you know, there's moments where the setter is going to decide who they set and all four or five of your hitters, everybody else has to be ready to attack, mm -hmm. but only one person's going to get that set. And, and they in not being surprised when it's your big moment. And I think that, uh, you know, so many correlations between are you, if you're a listener out there, are you ready for your big moment all the time? So when it does come your way, bam, you take advantage. Somebody said, you know, everybody gets their big break, but not, not everybody recognizes it or has the courage to take it. And there's so much recognition and courage that goes into leading and goes into trying to push yourself to a national championship. Um, and let's, let's flip the switch now as a, as a young guy who's married and has kids and how do you handle that work-life blend? I like to call it instead of balance because it's certainly not equal. Uh, but how do you handle that work-life blend? What are your keys to a high quality of survival in the midst of total commitment to your role? You marry someone that's got values that, uh, that, that work. I mean, it's, uh, for me, it's, it's so much about surrendering to, to, to the reality, surrendering, surrendering to the truth of just kind of what we're living in. And, you know, for us, I think we find, my wife and I found find peace and just, you know, our faith is a big part of it for us. Um, you know, knowing that those values are good, knowing that those values are going to work for people around us. Um, you know, and I, it, it really is, you know, you talk about teamwork, um, you know, and the grind of a day to day and there's, it, it's easy to look at something like marriage or raising kids as this is, this is a grind and, you know, to, to have someone around you that reminds you to kind of look around and be grateful. Um, that's huge. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the best teammate you could have when someone's there to support you. And, you know, you've obviously, you've got that as well. And you've got some awesome kids and an awesome yeah. wife. And I know we spend time talking about, wow, this is, this is great. Like this. Yeah, you gotta have it. Yeah. And uh, so I, I think that's, you know, for me and, and, and the team really is integrated into, we, we made some choices, you know, we live on campus and, and the guys are over all the time. And, uh, you know, we, we try to blend them in because that's how we want it to be. You know, it's, if we're going to do this, if we're going to invest this much time and energy into our work, um, we want it to, we want it to mirror family. We want it to kind of share those same values of, of that, that love and that, that pursuit. Um, so yeah, that's, well, I know this last year you've had some particular challenges. I know that one of your players came down and a 19 year old young guy, you know, comes down with cancer. And I know he's been, you know, you've been a big part of really his treatment plan and living at your home. And uh, so much so as like, you know, days after he was in the hospital and having his surgeries to really, you guys just took him into your family. And I know that, uh, you know, you have two daughters and one of them has a kind of rare condition. I, I'm She's not a rare condition. genetic disease. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you guys are just like, I see so much love pouring out of you on your family. And then I think that's another piece to the culture that you create at UC Irvine Volleyball, which right. is, you know, that this is a family. And yes, we, we express ourselves through the game of volleyball, but we are rooted in the community of family and culture and support. And at the same time, not just security. You're not like, 
it's about, yeah, we have this, but we're striving for something that you know, very few people will get to accomplish. And I think that's yeah. so hard as a leader to create a safe community where people feel loved and cared for. And at the same time, you can say, get out there and work your hardest sure. for something that very few people will actually achieve. Sure. I, I have an, um, we have an amazing uh, athletic director right now whose, whose values, I think it, she appreciates what we're doing. And I, at the end of the day though, you know, my job is still measured by wins and losses to the majority of the world. You know, as people look at us and that would be the same as a, you know, quarterly earnings report or, you know, that's our win loss record. And, you know, so with all these things that we're doing, all these things I believe in, I will do things these way because this way, because I believe in it. And if we don't get the wins, you know, th there is no security. Yeah. Well, you've landed the point as far as it's, it's, it's an endless challenge for all leaders mm -hmm. and people to invest yourselves deeply into a culture into creating a kind of community and at the same time there is a measurable that you know the outside world is looking at and going hey you've congratulations you're a real nice person but you know you didn't hit the number mm -hmm. what now uh so re i just want to say a huge thank you for you coming in and sharing your insights i hope you've uh, made people at least a little curious to watch a volleyball game with a new a new level of appreciation for how quick and chaotic it can be and there's just a real parallel to how quick and chaotic our lives can be and as we try to lead ourselves and our teams in you know, a grounded way in the midst of that chaos, I know you're trying to do that. I've been you know, just overjoyed to try to support you in doing that, to get to know the guys and these young men that you're cultivating through your program. Uh, so with that, just a huge thank you to Mr. David Niffin, Coach David Niffin, and all of the UC Irvine Anteaters for uh, their efforts on and off the court to make the world a better place and make a make the volleyball community really wake up to what is it really about. Um, and it, it has to be about people. Yeah. Well, your comment lane is you're coaching your own high school team and watching you and I'm still learning from you. You know, it's, if we're doing this right, we're making better people, better teammates, better volleyball players yeah. too, but that order. Yep. All right. Well, a big thank you. And thank you to all the listeners out there that dove in today and you go first. And, uh, I know you go first for your players, uh, I know I go first for my players and my team and my company and with our clients. And uh, it's just a privilege to watch you going first. I'm so proud of you. You know, this here, this, this little young high school kid that has grown up now and, and gone first uh, on, the, on the biggest stage in your sport. And uh, I wish you the very best. And I can't wait to see what you do next with your life and with your teams and with your family. So uh, thank you, David, for joining us this morning on You Go First. And congratulations on where you got yourself so far. Thanks, Len. You bet. I want to thank again Coach David Niffin for joining us on You Go First today. If you'd like to leave a comment for David, you can do that on the YouGoFirst.live. Or if you'd like to follow David and the Anteaters Volleyball Quest for a National Championship, you can follow their Instagram at UCIMVB, Men's Volleyball. So UCI Men's Volleyball. If you're finding this on the Odyssey team's Facebook and you'd like to make a comment, please put that below and we'll get that to David or we'll get right back to you. Thanks and make it a great day. Thanks for listening to another episode of You Go First. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to listen to another episode, you can find us at yougofirst.live or you can see more about our host, Lane Hensley, on his Instagram at One Dream Chaser. To learn more about his company, Odyssey Teams Inc., go to odysseyteams.com or follow all their social media channels at Odyssey Teams. Thanks again, and we hope that you will go first to share our podcast with a friend or colleague. Now, you go first.